Um, this morning, our topic is consecration. But first, I think it's always good to go back and do a quick review of what we've talked about before. And this book has actually been a pleasant surprise to me. <laughs> It, um, I really like the way it goes about showing us what Jesus' plan for evangelism was, not what our plan for evangelism was. And it starts at the very beginning. It doesn't start in the middle. <laughs> it starts at the beginning. And the beginning is the selection of the disciples. And... What we've learned is that Jesus didn't pick the smartest, the most educated, the shrewdest, the wealthiest, or the most famous, did he? And yet, what do we do? If we're a, if we're a hiring manager, who do we want on our team? The most qualified. Yes, we want the best and the brightest with the most experience. We're, we are, those are the qualities we're looking for, aren't they? Mm -hmm. But Jesus, by the world standards, picked unlearned and ignorant men. But the thing about these men was that they were men who were teachable. They were teachable. And they were honest and willing to confess their need for him. And they were men with big hearts who were fed up with the hypocrisy of the ruling aristocracy and were looking for someone to lead them in the way of salvation. These were the men that he picked. And why did he pick them? He picked them because he didn't have a short-term plan. He had a long-term plan. And that long-term plan was to pick men that he could train. Remember the word teachable. He was going to train a small group of committed men to leadership who would continue the ministry when he was gone. And I think that brings us to the question for us. This has never been, never seemed to be the strategy of the church in recent years. Can we make this our strategy? Can we look to the long term? Or are we going to insist on going for the short term? Then our second chapter is just as important, and that was on association. And association was simply that Jesus' focus was on his disciples and their association with him, one-on-one, -on -one, small group. He taught them with small group methods and by example, most important example, demonstrating great patience when correcting and encouraging. And with a small group, he could stay close to them, couldn't, couldn't he? He could know when they were getting filled with disinformation or misinformation and he could how do we say? Nip it in the butt. So that it didn't go very far. He could take care of it quickly. And while he did address the masses, his primary strategy was to use a small group of well-trained leaders to train other leaders to leadership in the same way. This was, again, a long-term, not a short-term approach. And again, the question, are we patient enough to follow this approach? Today, we begin a little bit different twist. And we've seen the selection, we've seen how he's trained them, and now, what do they have to do? What do they have to do? And the first thing is consecration. And when I saw consecration, the first thing I thought of was the song. And what was what might that song be? Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. 
But what does it mean? What does it mean? So we're going to start right off with a discussion at your table of the definition, coming up with a definition of consecration. So take a couple of minutes and see if you can come up with a definition of consecration in your groups. Consecration. Uh, we we set set apart for something holy. Set apart for something holy. That's good. Yeah, that's very good. Anybody else? Okay, I'm gonna take a stab at this. Did the leader consecrate the wine and the bread? Is that correct? Yeah. And so would that be like um, he makes it holy? He makes it. Blessed, he blesses it mm -hmm. and makes it holy. It makes it sacred. It makes it sacred. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Anybody talking, else? We talked about that. How it's with the communion elements, it's a common element that is turned into a sacred element <clears throat> in a spiritual way. And common men, common people, turn to a sacred task, sacred ordination. We also talked about how people consecrate, we, we think of it as it rightly should be used in the holy towards God, but also people do consecrate other things like substance abuse. They're, how we can set apart the wrong things. We can set ourselves apart for the wrong things. We can consecrate ourselves to the wrong things as well as the good. Sure. Very good. Thanks. You guys, anything different? Anything to add? Okay. So I um, took a moment to do some looking up and our former pastor Mark Hughes 
believed in the Merriam-Webster dictionary, the unabridged book, but I cheated and I used the internet version. <laughs> <laughs> don't email him, don't text him. Don't. So anyway, the definition of consecration by Merriam-Webster online is to make holy or to dedicate to a higher purpose. Something consecrated is dedicated to God and thus sacred. So everything you guys said. The King James Version's dictionary says to make or declare to be sacred by certain ceremonies or rites. That would be ordination. That would be blessing the bread for communion. Um, I suppose it could even go to baptism. Consecrating us. So it's appropriate to sacred uses, to set apart, dedicate, or devote to the service and worship of God. And I signed up for a, a little study on the internet that I wasn't sure. I'd never used this source before. I wasn't sure it was going to be good, but it was on Joseph. And to my um, surprise, in the past week, even today, <laughs> I've gotten things from that study that were directly applicable to this. And one of the things I received was mentioning of a term in Latin, carum deo. And it was defined as live your life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, for the glory of God. And what is consecration? of people as that. Is that not what we're talking about? It just really um, touched me. Of course it came after I turned my slides in. So. <laughs> I don't have a slide. But Coleman defines it as surrender of one's whole life to the master in absolute submission to his sovereignty. There can be no compromise. And he cites Luke 16, 13. No servant can serve two masters, for either he will love the one and hate the other, or else he will hold the one and despise the other. He cannot serve God and mammon. So what, when you think about consecration, and we've got excellent definitions of it, what does that entail? What? What does it mean? What does it mean? Um, it's the complete forsaking of sin. And I know I asked somebody to look up Matthew 5, 1 to 7, 29. And we're not reading it off, I promise. But I just wanted um, you to know what that was. What is in Matthew 5, 1 to 7, 29? The Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount. And in the Sermon on the Mount, who was Jesus teaching? His disciples. And what did he teach them? What was entailed in that? Pretty much everything. <laughs> in many ways, it was the, it was the consecrated laws of how to live uh, a Christ-like uh, life. Exactly. And it covered every aspect of humanity. It from did. From a, a spiritual perspective. I would, I would encourage you, if you've got a Bible that divides things into topics, go through that and just, you know, if you've got time, read the whole, read the whole thing. But for a quick look, just look at the topics that are discussed in that. It is everything. So the second thing is perfection of love is the only standard of conduct. And somebody looked up Matthew 548. Yeah. Can you read that to us? Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Can we succeed at that? 
Not totally. Without, not without his perfection. Without his perfection. In other words, it is his perfection that will work in our imperfection. Exactly. Exactly. Might we fail sometimes? Absolutely. And what do we do when we fail? Repent. 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 Repent, pick ourselves up and... Um, Move, move forward. So the second one, the third one has two parts. And the first part is this love was to manifest itself in obedience to Christ. And that would be John 14, 21 and 23. Did someone look that up? Could you read it? Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Jesus replied, Anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love them, and we will come to them and make our home with them. Yeah. So love, love is the key, right? Love is the key. If you're obedient to Christ, God's going to be there. Christ's going to be there. They're going to welcome you. And the second part of that is that how should that love be expressed? It should be expressed in devotion to those he died to save. Someone look up John, no, Matthew 25, 31 to 36. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Yeah. When we do for others, we're doing for Christ. Denial of self to help others. That's what Jesus wanted us to do. That was part of his plan. And the last one the cross. The cross has to be there, doesn't it? And the cross, again, was denial of self for others, and that's Matthew 16, 24 to 26. He said, then, um, then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. For whosoever wants to save their lives will lose it. But whoever loses his life because of me will find it. For what will it benefit someone to gain the whole world and yet loses his life? Or what will anyone give in exchange for his life? What do you think about those verses? It's a hard word. Come on. Hard in our own inclination because we tend to be me, 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 self, self-absorbed. And the the idea of something that goes against what is our nature is sort of hard to fathom. Something that has to be taught. <clears throat> Typically, what Christ was good at doing was uh, putting his 12 ordinaries who are like us at a position uh, to follow the leader, seeing, learning, repetitiously looking at it, seeing. Because we right. can be very visual. Right, exactly. The example of Christ so important, so very important. That we have to we have to follow. We have to follow that. So how did the people respond to the message of the cross? And we're gonna start with the disciples. How did they respond to the message of the cross? Well, they didn't get it all immediately, did they? Did anybody think of some times when they didn't get it? Yeah. 
when, yeah. when Peter's saying, no, you're, you're not going to go to the cross? Right. Yeah. I've been thinking of many times with Peter. <laughs> yeah, many yeah, times. But, you know, like when you know, Jesus was really showing that example when he was washing their feet. And the, the idea of needing to be washed and consecrated. And Peter's like, no, don't wash my feet. I'll wash your feet. And Jesus said, well, I don't if I don't wash your feet, you have no part of me. I'll wash my not just my feet, but my whole body. That, that was a picture of setting apart for the sacrifice for the cross. That's right. That's right. Anything else? Whenever they would bicker on who's going to be. Yeah, who's going to sit right. closest? Yeah. <laughs> who, yes. who, who gets to be who's there? Your, who's your favorite Jesus? That was my head. <laughs> <laughs> I won't want to be number one. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like the kids on the sand in the sand lot picking teams. Mm-hmm. I want to be picked first. Me yeah. first. Me first. Yeah. I don't want to be the last one standing up. <laughs> And their um, ability to see the deeper truths was encumbered by human frailty. And Pat, you hit the nail on the head with with Peter. One of the things was indeed, you know, that when Jesus is telling them he has to die on the cross, and Peter says, no, no, no. And what does Jesus say back to him? Get the gun on you, <laughs> Yeah, the devil's got you, Peter. <laughs> the devil's got you. Get, get behind. And then last Sunday's sermon came to me in thinking about Paul's Christian friends. Paul felt the Holy Spirit calling him to go to Jerusalem. He, in his consecration to the Lord, he felt that call to go to Jerusalem. And what did his friends do? They said, don't go. They said, don't go in many different ways, many different friends. And I think, again, that's our human frailty of not always being able to see what God is calling someone else to do. We just see the danger. Mm -hmm. And I remember this in myself when the girls, I don't remember what Middle Eastern country they were in, but they were taken... They were missionaries, girls as missionaries first. What parent would let them go? You know, what were they doing there? And then they're taken captive, and the whole world is watching that. And I'm just like, why were they even there? What were they thinking? Well, they were consecrated to the Lord, and they felt a call to be there. To be there for other women who were being persecuted and to share with them the love of the of mm-hmm. Jesus. That reminds me of, of Grisha Burnham, who the, the one who was captive in the Philippines, and said, I heard her saying once, I wouldn't have had it going for a year, year and 15 months. I wouldn't have had Mark killed. But you know what? God is God. You know, and, and she yielded to his will, even in the desert. And how hard is that, folks? How hard is that? How often do we succeed and how often do we fail at that? But then on the other hand, when you, you, know, you think about uh, Paul's position spiritually, that is one time where sometimes it's difficult for us, even though we're believers, to conceptualize taking what I call a, a Christly risk. Yeah. against what appeared to be valid advice from his friends, and yet he was willing to take a uh, Christy risk. Right. He knew what God was calling him to do. And, you know, he would have, you know, probably like all of us, he would have liked for someone to have said, you know, I support you in that. I hear that you're being called to do that. I, I fear for you. But I understand, and I'll support you. How often do we do that, and how often do we just say, Don't do it! Mm-hmm. Yeah, Don't do it! What makes that such a, what, 
which makes that which make what makes that so deep is uh, Paul had been given prophetic word. It was a, a prophecy, so to speak, that he was going to be binded up. Right. And yet there was something in him spiritually that uh, prompted him to take a pricey risk. Right. The Holy Spirit was telling him to go. Right. Telling him to go, and so he went. Much um, one of those things where you wish that you could be sure that if, you, if the Holy Spirit told you to go and do something that was a bit risky, that you would listen and follow through on that. Absolutely, Sister Daddy. That's my thinking. That, to me, that, that is just phenomenal that uh, right. Paul was at that place spiritually. That he could do that. Yes, absolutely. Exactly. Exactly. And I, um, you know, we the ladies' class has been studying Jeremiah for quite a long time, and one of the things that we've come back to over and over again is the thing that people weren't listening to Jeremiah. They weren't. They didn't want to listen. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to know what he was saying and how important in our own lives it is for us to open our ears and to hear and to open our hearts and to know when it's God calling, when it's Jesus calling, when we are being, and we're in, you know, if we go with, with the Lord, if we are with the Lord, then what's supposed to happen is what's gonna happen. So if it was that hard for the disciples, <laughs> how hard was it for people like you and me who weren't learning at the master's feet, who may have heard him speak like at a Billy Graham crusade. They may have gotten that far and they liked him, but when they came to him and wanted to know exactly what they needed to do, what was their response to this kind of information? That's a little too much. That's a little too much. Very hard to him believe. Pardon? Very hard for him to make him believe. Yeah. They didn't believe this was happening. Really, 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 really. But some of them didn't, did they? When they were when they were tasked with what they were what they had to do. Lots of them had excuses had excuses. Let me go bury my father first. <laughs> exactly. I have a bazillion things I need to go take care of. You know, I got to take care of the bank account. Got to make sure the kids have <laughs> someone to watch after. Because we, in, the, in the West, have been relatively comfortable and been meant to have a good love of freedom, which is great. I've probably developed what is we call cultural Christianity, where we tend to compartmentalize our Christianity <clears throat> Sunday morning or to the food bank or things that we do instead of this complete surrender to God. And you know that whole bound to your house and home. You know, we give we let Jesus into the foyer of our house in the living room, but we don't let him anywhere else. There's certain rooms that are off limits for Jesus. And I think what we're seeing right now, even around the world, is you always see this when it comes to Christians that are persecuted. Is that that's not an option to be compartmentalized Jesus. You see, with, I've been seeing videos and videos of Ukrainian Christians just laying it all on the line, serving each other, singing together. There's no choice to compartmentalize. And that's important for us to remember that we we have that luxury, and that luxury can actually be a trap if we're not careful. Exactly. And, and this chapter was really convicting in that regard for me. Um, what I respond as a unit, unit, Ukrainian Christians are, um, well, he wants to prepare me for that possibility. And so I hadn't fasted in like 25 years before, a year or so ago. But that's one of the things that, that he has called me to practice periodically or, or to give up a particular thing. Things that in themselves might seem small things but unless I start obeying him in those, no, I wouldn't be ready. Right. So 
I think we've determined that the criteria to be a consecrated follower of Christ may seem overwhelming, but the blessings, the blessings are immeasurable. Immeasurable. And so at your tables, I would like for you to discuss obstacles today, what this whole group discussion has been, for making such a commitment, and then talk about some ways to overcome them. talk about this a long time. So what did some of you come up with? We want to talk about obstacles and then we want to talk about ways to overcome the obstacles. We never got to the ways to overcome. Okay, that's fine. In obstacles, we listed uh, lack of time, um, uh, priorities, not prioritizing the faith, uh, the whole tolerance movement, and nothing can be wrong. In our high level of comfort, we're very used to pretty instant gratification. Exactly. All of, all of the above, right? All of the above. Anything else? Well, I was similar to there. You just summed it up as uh, having a Western mentality. And we do. You summed up the whole concept of what uh, Sister Pat talked about. It's just the Western mentality that maybe. Uh, for us, is covers us, spoil us, and right. uh, we 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 believe that we're owed the freedom and liberty. 
And we like to be in control, don't we? Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, we like that control. Anybody else? Any? My job has a really good way of what they sell us on is work-life balance. And in a sense, it's almost like they consecrate work is for work and your life is, is, is life. Everything that's not work. Um, but we, it's never work-life balance with with. God, we just wrap everything under, you know, life with that's not work. And this mentality or this cultural comfort of, you know, work-life balance, but we, we keep those separate, but we, we tend to, to not keep what we have going on in our everyday life separate from, you know, our time with God. Right. We try to wrap that all together with just our life, and that should be set apart um, and, and consecrated and it's hit since the time we spend with each other, fellowshipping, um, worshiping, and, you know, any type of service to, to, to the church, we, we tend to not separate that from life. We just say, we're going to include that with our everyday things and not consecrate. Right. You had some? Yeah. Uh, as, as a young Christian man, uh, I kind of see that young men and women tend to prioritize other things over God. Like, oh, I'll get to read scripture eventually, or I'll, I'll pray someday, or I got this today, God, I'll be okay. And when inevitably that's not true. Because uh, I know from experience that putting other things first before God will only hurt you. Right, right. I'm going to close it down because we're getting close on time and we've got a couple of things to talk about. But um, I think all of you hit the nail on the head in terms of things that um, are obstacles. And I, I think Pastor Luke really um, brought home when he was talking about the rooms in the house and I'm not going to read this slide, but basically it's a story about a pastor who didn't talk about rooms in the house, but he talked about um, places in the heart and handing that his ministry was hampered because he kept one, he kept the key to one of the chambers. He handed the Lord a bunch of keys, but he kept one. And it was keeping that one that kept his ministry from going. And it wasn't until he gave that one up as well that his ministry began to flourish. So the first thing we've got to do is we've got to clean out our heart. We've got to clean out the rooms in our house and give the keys to every single one of them to the Lord. And it's only at that point that we're going to get rid of all these obstacles about comfort and time and um, control, you know, it's all it's all got to be given to the Lord to be His time and His comfort and His needs. Um, so I would ask you, the next thing I was going to do, this is not something for us to discuss, but I just want you to take away this week to think about what are the places in your heart? What are the rooms in your house that you need to give the key to the Lord, that you failed to give that key away, and see if you can do that. And the example to follow is Jesus, right? He was the example to the disciples for all of us. He was perfect in every way. He was totally obedient to God. And Coleman says, just as Jesus found his blessedness doing his Father's will, even so his followers would find theirs. And this is the sole duty of the servant. Which brings us to, we have to think of ourselves, even if we want to be a leader in our church, we have to think of that in the overall context of we're still servants. You know, that word public servants has lost its meaning. We have people who don't want to be a public servant. They want to be, they just want to have their will done, <laughs> don't they? Just whatever they want is what should happen. 
public so, serves them. Huh? The public serves them. Exactly. The public serves them. So, um, what was Jesus' focus? What was his focus for consecration? He wanted to, he said that no one can be a leader until he learns to follow a leader. And why is that? Because we're supposed to be servants. And a good leader is still going to teach you to be a servant first. Right? So the first thing is that you can't be a leader until you follow a leader. And this isn't really hard for us, even in the West. We've all had mentors. We've all had people as we started out in the career that we looked up to. Um, kids look up to their parents. They're following the lead of their parents. We don't always know that the leader is a good leader, but we are, as human beings, I think, willing to follow a leader. I think the wonderful thing that made Christ such an apex of serving leadership is the fact that as a leader, he always asked, how might I serve you? Right, how might I serve you? It goes back to Pastor Luke and as saying, Jesus washing the feet right. of the disciples. Yeah, a leader lowering themselves to be the servant. And then Jesus was focused on discipline and respect for authority. Now that, <laughs> <laughs> that is not so easy, is it? <laughs> Yeah, I don't want you telling. Don't you tell me what to do. <laughs> I don't want you to tell me what to do. We don't. That one's harder. But Jesus said we had to focus on discipline and respect for authority because who is the ultimate authority? Mm -hmm. Our Trinity is the ultimate. authority. And he knew, and he did this because he knew that the disciples could not outwit the devilish powers of this world unless they gave strict adherence to him alone. Because he alone had what? Strategy to victory. Strategy to victory. He alone had that. And if you didn't have discipline to his authority then how were you going to follow him to avoid the devil and not get caught up in his spider web? How were you going to do that? And he knew they had to abandon his own will 